that was a glimpse of the kind of images that you and I get bombarded with day in, day out. Television has changed our lives, our biological clock. It has altered equations and relationships within a family and in society as a whole. Images portrayed on television channels not only impact impressionable children and the young, but senior citizens as well. Today I find that my children, they are watching, they are accepting all that violence that is happening around them. And to a certain extent, it is making them a little insensitive. All the bahus are becoming smarter and the husbands are becoming smarter and whatever they're coming up. So television does have an impact on the lives of people in both good and not so good ways. An old question keeps recurring. Does art imitate life? Or does life imitate art? Karl Thapar, who is an ex-army man, his son Vijayan Thapar, he lost his life in the Kargil war. And he was a Veer Chakra for that. I called them up in Delhi. I wanted to obviously meet them and speak to them about their son. So when I when I called up, uh, the mother came on the line and she's told me that, uh, Mr. Datta, we were waiting for your call. We know that you're making a film called LOC. She said, but uh, Mr. Datta, thanks to you, my son is no more in this world. So when she said that, I was taken aback. I said, Madam, how, how am I responsible? She said, well, he was obsessed with the border. He had seen it about 15 to 16 times. And uh, he was very affected by that film. And maybe because of that, he did the act that he did and got a wheel chakra. Television no longer creates heroes and heroines. It goes far beyond. It creates prototypes of family members such as the mother-in-law, the daughter-in-law, or the sister-in-law. Every character should be predictably either noble and lily-white or villainous and jet black. How did this change come about? The answers are not difficult to find. India is the only country in the world where there are more television sets with cable connections than telephone lines. In a country where less than half its citizens get water or electricity at home, as many as one third of Indian households own a television set. It is also the only country where for the equivalent of four or five US dollars a month, a subscriber can get to view up to a hundred television channels. At the time of making this documentary in July 2003, India's television industry was engulfed in turmoil over the introduction of a conditional access system for pay television channels. The Indian television viewer currently gets to view much, much more than what she or he could have imagined, say, in 1990. But sheer quantity has not meant quality. Far from it. For many private television channels, both Indian and foreign, content is driven by a crude chase to catch eyeballs. Television programs are having a profound impact on public opinion, lifestyles, social values, and behavioral trends. A lot of it is quite problematic. Ministry of Information and Broadcasting may on occasion come down hard on channels showing sexually explicit material. But such action has been sporadic at best. Even today, one can surf channels, not late at night but during the day, to come across material that is titillating to say the least. No warnings are issued, nor are films certified for an unsuspecting viewer. The conditional access system, I've had it in my house for donkey's years. Kids, you watch this, whatever your peer pressure, 
Why can't you be the pressure point for your peers? Why should you succumb to peer pressure? That's the question that I ask my kids. And I sit there and I sit down and watch those programs with them. Who does not know that sex sells and sells rather well? What is perhaps more worrisome is the manner in which gratuitous violence is depicted on the screen. It could take the form of cartoons, scenes of war in news reports, visuals of the World Trade Center going up in flames being repeated over and over again. Violence is glamorized, shown in slow motion with sound effects, far removed from the painful and ugly reality. A non-government organization, the Center for Advocacy and Research, conducted a study on the impact of media violence on children in five Indian cities between January and August 2001. Their findings were startling. It revealed that there was a high incidence of violence in video games and television shows of all genres across channels and time bands. Fourteen acts of violence are shown every hour. That is, one every 15 seconds. What is worse is the fact that children now view television anywhere between two hours and ten hours each day. So crime, violence, horror, melodrama was all packaged as one common experience, a unified experience that they were exposed to. And we hardly, you know, they were, uh, one of the things that, you know, we were struck by was the fact that children of six and eight had memories that went back to two and four. And a lot of that memory was of, you know, things that were, you know, around horror and terror, which they had seen on TV. And it continues to haunt them. If they feel, if they believe that their world is more violent, then they will tend to be more violent. While actually it is not so. So there is a, what I'm trying to say is that there is a mismatch between reality and perception. The more you watch television, the more you will be away from reality. You will be more in a world of fantasy. It's hardly a secret that sex and violence sells, and sells very well. But a combination of the two, namely the depiction of violent sex or rape, can and often does exceed limits. Cheat Entertainment. <laughs> This is the sanitized version of the film Hawa's promo. The original was considered too explicit. Such a promo can come in between a break in the program. Certain commercials are responsible for extreme forms of stereotyping. Advertisements are supposed to make you aspire for a better life, but some of them display racism, gender and class bias. People who are different are degraded. Prejudices are reinforced, and the worst kinds of macho behavior are encouraged. This advertisement was withdrawn later, but this one, with its blatant class bias, continued. There are other advertisements making impossible claims. What would stop a youngster from believing these or similar claims made by manufacturers of refrigerators and toothpaste? There are self-regulatory bodies like the Advertising Standards Council of India, which receives complaints from consumers against advertisements considered offensive. After the council approaches the advertisers concerned, in 85% of the cases, the offensive advertisements are withdrawn or modified. Uh, if we, we give him some time to do it, if he does not do it, then we write to his advertising agency and we write to the media which uh, aired or published uh, the ad to withdraw the ad. And in most cases we have found that uh, advertising agency or the this thing take action. They are very rare when uh, cases when uh, somebody is not uh, really willing to do it. But some commercials have had an irreversible impact on particular viewers. A child tried to emulate what was shown in this commercial and died. Advertisers remain within the ambit of the law by inserting a warning. 
but such messages can hardly be read in the limited time it is flashed on the screen. Serials such as Shaktiman, an Indian version of a Superman-like character, have also had disastrous effects on children who try to emulate the feats of this character. In one case, it is reported that a child immolated himself believing Shaktiman would come and save them. In another tragic instance, a nine-year-old girl from Simapuri, a lower middle class locality in Delhi, hung herself from a ceiling fan after watching a similar scene on a different television serial. So I said that I was going to put a fan on it. So I told him that I didn't want to put a fan on it. So he put a fan on it and he put a fan on it and he put a fan on it. He put a fan on it and 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 he put a fan on it. In the case of Shaktiman, the producer has tried to make amends. He has produced episodes showing how the special effects on screen were actually performed and added positive social messages. Sorry, Shaktiman. Friends, the body, the shape of the body, the shape of the body, the shape of the body. The producer of Shaktiman is not the only individual who became circumspect. Television serial producer Ekta Kapoor too sought to make amends after a character in a so-called family drama was told about the sex of an unborn child. We not only apologized, but we also, you know, clarified that that was never the intention. Uh, I remember the scene specifically. It was this couple who comes to the hospital, and the doctor, the doctor or the nurse, I'm not sure, tells the couple ki Mubarak ho ladka hai. The apology came after the Maharashtra State Commission for Women moved court. They have intention to undo the things and all that in the public interest. Um, they, they, they have, but only it's a question of quantum. It might be asked whether legislation is always required to control what is being broadcast. Can self-regulation be the best solution to protect interests of viewers? Or is the flick of a button on the remote in the hands of a person watching television an adequate safeguard? Clearly, there are no simple answers to these questions. As per the Cable Act, only universal film should be shown. Any program, whether it is advertisement or uh, the promos, they should be you categorized by CBFC. Now, all channels particularly the one who are uplinking from outside the country, they are not following this procedure. We don't have that infrastructure. We, we are not the police. See, we get the films, we certify them, we categorize them, and the implementation we can't do. Out of assembly lines producing television serials come episodes where women are always dressed to kill even inside the kitchen. Saris are named after characters on the screen. Producers predictably claim they provide what audiences want. Why is that? That the people are still watching those soaps which we call them socially irrelevant and not some other soaps or not the... Why are the TRPs of the National Geographic channels or the discoveries or even for that matter Doordarshan are not happening? It's the question of how people are taking it. It's a catch-22 situation. The television in India is still going through its catharsis. We shouldn't forget that. There was a time when Doordarshan also produced uh, classics which people remember. Hamlog, Bunyab, Handan are serials which uh, every citizen of India uh, remembers with pride. Now there are so many channels, there are so many programs to choose from. In such a situation, uh, things have become very competitive and unfortunately commercial channels have uh, taken a wrong route of showing things which are not always uh, uh, desirable or have positive impact on uh, people's mind. If they are so popular and if they remain relevant to the present context, why isn't that, you know, the Buniyad which was shown on set Sony television probably had a TRP of, you know, 1.2. In India and in most parts of the world, audiences are far less homogeneous than what particular broadcasters perceive them to be. Who decides what people wish to watch? Does popularity ensure quality? 
Has the depiction of violence at home become a commercial imperative? I think it moves between reinforcing stereotypes and creating occasional ambiguities. But unfortunately, I think what we have is eventually a set of middle class bourgeois stereotypes with one extra difference. In all these soap operas, it's the woman who are seen as being more vindictive and more violent. And I think that's something new. It's not patriarchal violence. It's the violence of women and what they do to each other that becomes significant in a soap opera. Journalists are supposed to highlight the shortcomings that afflict society. India's news media has been proactive in highlighting problems, exposing corruption and abuse of power. But does good news tend to be relegated to the background more often than not? In the western Indian state of Gujarat, there was a devastating earthquake in January 2001. The media was quick to report on the tragedy. And unlike many occasions in the past, followed the story up with reports on the inadequate rehabilitation of the victims of the natural calamity. However, this hampered the natural process of healing of the emotional wounds suffered by the victims. One four-year child asked his parents two months after the earthquake, how long is this earthquake going to last? How long will it continue? Although the earthquake had settled in 45 minutes time or so, the repeated portrayals of these images made the child think that the earthquake is going on and on. Akshar Soni is the son of these visually impaired parents. They used to learn about what was happening around them by listening to their son who would be explaining to them what he was watching on television. The reporting on the communal riots in Gujarat proved too much for this eight-year-old. You know, he was horrified. He wanted to ask me why is this. I mean, it was difficult to uh, watch and not to watch. That was a dilemma. And then we finally decided not to watch the TV. Uh, that was the only solution we could do. Dange, dekhte hi nahi lagta tha ki ye sab hain yun kya kar rahe hain. Pushta tha to to bhi pura kena padta tha, pura to yad nahi rehta tha. Isliye pura pata bhi nahi chalta tha. Those affected by the communal violence were ambivalent to the media coverage. Despite the effect repeated viewing of the riots had on some victims, others wanted the media to continue highlighting their plight. They actually felt more secure with the media around them. If we are to cover tragedy, violence, death and destruction, then in some form or the other, we will always be seen by some as those who are making our careers, you know, uh, somehow feeding off those tragedies. But there's another way of looking at it. And the other way of looking at it is that often people who have suffered tragedy, who have lost somebody they love, who have experienced violence, they do not want to be ignored. In 1999, when the Kargil war was on, you were accused of endangering the lives of Indian soldiers. You were using a satellite phone inside a bunker, and it was alleged that that satellite phone had alerted the enemy. They had fired on that bunker resulting in the deaths of soldiers. Is this allegation correct? The army was using about 50 Iridium satellite phones, the same satellite phones that we were using. NDTV was one of 20 to 30 media crews using the same satellite phone. Not once was a disclaimer put out by the army that these satellite phones should not be operational in this area because it may cause vulnerability to our positions. In fact, when a couple of newspapers did uh, sort of launch what I believe is really a hushed whisper campaign that sprang more from some kind of malicious discontent or malcontent than anything else, the army actually issued a written clarification uh, clarifying the point that since they were using Iridium satellite phones themselves, the satellite phones were of no danger whatsoever to the operations. 
my conscience uh, is completely clear on this one. Another prominent television journalist was accused of faking interviews of criminals who had allegedly rigged elections in 1989. If somebody has a problem about the veracity, the credibility of what I did at that time, please ask the court to summon the tapes. I'm that confident and believe me that we have kept the tapes uh, as they're, they're under lock and key and they're under lock and key with me. So I, I say this quite openly that uh, if, if there is a problem, challenge us. These are issues that cannot always be situated in terms of black or white. There are many shades of grey in between. If journalists have been accused of overstepping their limits, those making reality shows or candid camera programs have often had to face similar accusations. If the use of hidden cameras is permitted by investigative journalists, for instance, the journalists at Tehelka.com used hidden cameras to expose corruption in high places, does the same logic apply to makers of other television programs? Consider, for instance, the Bakra show on MTV. The show is apparently popular because it makes a fool out of an innocent person in front of the camera. Such scenes may make you smile or even make you guffaw your guts out. But put yourself in the place of the person who has just been made to appear foolish. The problem is that it's just comedy, it's just fun. And the whole thing is at the end of the show, we're not trying to humiliate someone. We're just trying to show them in awkward moments and then we, we make it up to them. We say sorry and if they don't like it, we don't want to air it. Uh, let me tell you something. In the upper market segment, I know we get a lot of flack for this. In the upper market segment, I try to shoot a lot. But they keep saying don't air it. I have so many tapes and I have models, actors, all who have not let me air, air their stuff. But that's the way it is. Because they were not willing to laugh at themselves, they take themselves too seriously. But it's still better, I think, that we do this kind of program than we do as another serious soap opera and another sass and another bahu and another uh, cousin and uncle and aunt. And because I think if you see any more of this, whatever brain we've got left, it'll just go into your body and disappear and we'll all die. It is not merely program producers, but broadcasters as well, who determine not just the content, but also the look and feel of what is eventually broadcast. Are all broadcasters prisoners of the rating system? Do they decide whether they should be socially responsible or are they bothered only about the bottom lines on the balance sheets of their companies? We have to earn money to pay for ourselves and pay for this. So, I mean, we are a commercial enterprise and uh, it's not profit is the only motto because, you know, I mean, if you ever run a business, you will discover that uh, quality is the only motto and a corollary of quality usually is profit. Is it necessary? that educative and socially responsible programs should be dull and shoddily produced? Does a decent program not have a market? We have come up with a few programs which have uh, broken this myth. For instance, uh, in our uh, partnership with BBC, we have a program on HIV AIDS awareness. We came up with a very uh, interesting format of a detective serial. Detective serials are always interesting. And uh, on top of that, we made it an interactive detective serial. This program became one of the top five programs of Doordarshan. Indian television is unique in more ways than one. The gap between the reach of television and that of radio is relatively narrow. Kisan bhaiyo bheno, namaskar. Aaj ki is karikram mein aap sabhi ka swagat hai. Doordarshan's channels are watched by nearly twice the number of individuals who watch programs on private television channels. At the same time, since the early 1990s, cable television in India has ceased to be confined to the so-called classes, but become a truly mass medium viewed in some 45 million homes. In a country where one third of the population is officially illiterate, that is, they cannot even sign their own names. Television, more than radio, and certainly the print medium, has tremendous potential. Yet, it is a double-edged sword. Television can become the opium of the masses, cocaine for the classes. But that same idiot box can become a window of hope and opportunity. 
Certain broadcasters say they are conscious of their social responsibility and work towards fulfilling it. We have a program called Rock the Vote, which basically tells people, go out there because you make a difference. We don't want to break the apathy because a lot of young people don't care. Uh, they're disillusioned, they're cynical. We try to break that cynicism and that disillusion. Uh, in areas like leprosy, you know, we worked with the BBC Trust who came and said that a lot of people, there's a stigma attached to it. What can MTV do? We know that our spokespeople, our anchors and our VJs are very, very strong role models as far as young people are concerned. So seeing a Malaika or a Shanaz actually hugging a leprosy victim can make a world more of a difference than having some 60-year-old stand and preach in front of a bunch of teenagers. We are very strict what kind of pictures we should use, how to balance the story. Don't take any story on air without having all the versions involving all the parties together. Don't use wrong pictures. Don't edit it mischievously. I know many people do it in the market, but it doesn't work. Viewers don't get, get impressed by that. Some believe a day will come when viewers would start demanding better programs and broadcasters and producers would have no choice but to oblige. I see new possibilities, new conversations. And in that sense, I think TV is going to play a fantastic role in making India progressive. I mean, people blame soap operas, people blame the staid news agencies. But I think just by getting fragments of new imagination in, TV eventually might be the most progressive force we have. Indirectly, ironically, unintentionally. And I hope it remains that way. Social responsibility is not just a question of laws and statutes, nor is it merely a moral issue. Citizens, have to become more aware and viewers more discerning. What would emerge out of this chaos and out of this anarchy remains to be seen. But one thing is certain, can you as a viewer afford to remain passive? If you do, you are certain to be bombarded with more and more trash. Television is the most powerful medium of this era. It can not merely entertain you. Television distorts reality. It can even destroy. At the same time, it not merely informs you and educates you, it even has the potential to empower you. It's only a public broadcaster that can devote half an hour a week to the children of a lesser god.